So Jerry has incredible uh, resume. He is currently director of technology development for COHU. And he's also a part-time facility member at the University of California, San Diego Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department. His major responsibilities at COHU is in development of thermal control architectures, been at that for many years. And uh, he's used handler technology that they produce as well. He has BS and PhD degrees in mechanical engineering from Wayne State University. I hail from Detroit, so I know where that is. Jerry has a total of 48 years experience in the industry, he beats me, working in computer peripherals, mechanical designs, device packaging, thermal control, and boy, he blows me away in terms of number of patents, 53 patents at present and four more in the works. Jerry, take it away. Okay, thank you everybody. Uh, I think you did say I was a facility manager at uh, UCSD, <laughs> part-time instructor, so. Oh, sorry, I, I read that wrong, but anyway, go for it. All right, okay, so I'm gonna talk about some of the uh, thermal challenges we have in, uh, you know, pick and place uh, test handlers. And our challenges are different than uh, some of the ones you've been hearing for, uh, for server design, package design, uh, other things. We have, uh, a number of requirements. Uh, there's technology that we we have that uh, really, uh, you know, we we can't even put in because of marketing factors or other, other things like that. So I'll try to briefly talk about uh, some of that. A little bit here about uh, you know coolant sources. Uh, we use a number of coolant sources. They all have uh, their uh, pluses and minuses. Uh, the geometric constraints we have to work with. Uh, Tim is a big issue for us. Uh, Dave talked a little bit about. Uh, I should have a little bit. He uh, did a you know pretty comprehensive talk on Tim. Uh, Tim for us has additional requirements. Uh, talk about the power temperature gradients, how they affect us, uh, and some uh, thermal control strategies. Okay, so cooling sources. We uh, you know we do use uh, air in some of our systems. You know it's inexpensive, benign. You know of course it can only be used at hot set points and a limited power capacity. Uh, you know, the, uh, if you use it for high performance, it actually gets noisy. We had one situation where uh, we had a system where we actually had uh, uh, three 15 horsepower compressors and at the installations, they were complaining about the noise. Uh, so when I went there, I thought our compressor would cause a problem. I thought we did a good job of uh, you know, uh, making them quiet. When I got there, I found out that the test electronics had these high performance fans on the VRMs. And it wasn't our 15 horsepower compressors that were bothering it was actually the fans. So when we do use the uh, you know fans in high performance applications, you know when when it's allowable, uh, you know the noise is really more of an issue with people than uh, anything else. Okay. Uh, we do use liquid. You know you get much better performance. Uh, our systems typically we have uh, liquid cooling, and then we have we use that for cooling, but we also have uh, heating there. Uh, we usually use the liquid. Uh, we change the liquid temperature at a slower speed. Uh, we either change the temperature of the liquid itself, or we actually uh, you know, uh, regulate the flow of the liquid, get different uh, But we have uh, uh, heaters, uh, and this allows us to be very responsive. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Of course, the best fluids are either flammable or they're limited in temperature range. You know, we'd love to use water everywhere. Uh, we have to be able to handle temperatures above 100 degrees C and below uh, zero degrees C. When you start, uh, you know, putting uh, additives in uh, in water, you uh, you start compromising uh, the performance. The other fluids that are available, some of the ones that are used uh, by the military, they're they they can be flammable. Even the ones that are inert, uh, you know, like HFE, they have lower performance. Uh, you know, they, you know, it's hard to find a, uh, a fluid that has the, you know, optimal performance over entire range. Uh, our customers require us to go anywhere from minus 55 to over 175 degrees C, uh, specifically in the automotive applications. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, uh, typically you have a, uh, a chiller or uh, some type of heat exchanger for this fluid that's remote from the handler itself. And then you have to worry about the temperature losses over that line, especially at the cold applications. Okay. We do use LN2 in some of our products. Uh, there, uh, it depends on uh, you know which installations. Some have it facilitated, 
and uh, they want everything with uh, with LM2. Uh, some installations ban it; you can't even use it. Uh, but uh, you know, it uh, does allow you to get to extremely cold temperatures. And you know, our biggest challenge is—I think you probably hear there for me a couple times during uh, uh, this talk—are at the low temperatures, not necessarily at the hot. Uh, the, but the LM2 does have low uh, thermal capacity. You need to put a lot of it in there to get a lot of power out. Uh, the consumption is costly, and there are safety concerns. Uh, the safety mostly, you know, if you flood the area with nitrogen, you really starve the oxygen. And, you know, that, that is a, a concern at many installations. And so, you know, we get resistance from customers to use it, you know, for various reasons. Uh, we do use refrigeration. Uh, we've had a couple of programs that uh, successfully use refrigeration. And, you know, again, we don't use refrigeration alone. We use refrigeration along with the heater technology. Uh, it's most effective if you can get it right to the test site, uh, not through a secondary medium. Uh, the, uh, we found it to be very uh, effective. Uh, the issue we run into again is when we start going to cold temperatures. If you want to use a uh, refrigeration uh, that is economical, you want to stick with a one, uh, a one stage compressor. And uh, that also you know, limits you to about minus 40 degrees C. You can go to two, uh, two stage compressors or three stage compressors. You run into multiple issues. One, they become very expensive. They become very large. Uh, they're not uh, environmentally friendly from the point of view that they take a lot of power. And there's also a problem that uh, you know these compressors all have uh, oil, uh, and you know you, you have these uh, issues that at the real cold temperatures under minus 40 degrees C, if oil uh, migrates toward your uh, thermal unit away from where the compressor is, which is remote. Uh, it doesn't necessarily come back. Uh, you know, it doesn't flow very well. Uh, during our control, we have to modulate the flow. So you ne don't necessarily get the velocity that you need to get it back. Okay, so again, it's, uh, it, it gets fairly complex when we have to do the, uh, uh, the very cold temperatures. Uh, at uh, temperatures where we have to test anyway, let's say between the seat sweet spot between uh, 80 degrees C and 100 deg uh, 20 degrees C, for instance, uh, it's excellent. Okay, and then we, we have done some work, you know, you're looking at the future, uh, and, uh, actually water with phase change. Uh, you know, the, this was actually an effort started by uh, another uh, it's a computer company. I'm not gonna mention their name since I don't have the permission to, to do that, uh, but they're actually taking water and, uh, you know, putting droplets on the surface of the dye. And, uh, you know, we've done a little work in that area also, and, uh, it's unbelievable what type of uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, power density you can handle. And the, uh, the advantage also is it's a benign fluid. Uh, you, know, you can do temperatures as low as 80 degrees C uh, with this, uh, you know, with, with some enhancements in there. Uh, and uh, you, know, the, uh, you can imagine a large uh, die that has uh, power dissipation distributed you can actually direct the uh, small particles right on top of the uh, dye to the area where you want to cool. So it's a promising technology. Uh, it's something that uh, you know, we're really not seeing coming up in the future because nobody really wants a test handler that can only go 80 degrees C or above. That's just not something anybody asked for. You want to be able to do it to the entire temperature range. So we run into a lot of problems with using metrics constraints, uh, specifically flatness. So if you look at a thermal unit, and you know, I've got an exaggerated drawing on there. So we have a, a duct there that uh, you know, is uh, shown convex, and this is typically what we do see. Uh, this causes problems because you know, obviously you have gaps in there. Uh, we can put TIMs in there, but the TIMs are very limited. Uh, you, you know, you'd have to find a very uh, a compliant TIM. If you do uh, find a compliant TIM, if it takes a set, then it may not fit on the next one. Uh, so uh, what we've been fortunate with is that uh, most of the devices that we get are convex. And uh, you know, it, we see the issue more in the large units. And uh, when we socket them, we actually straighten them out. Now there, you know, they, there is some uh, small uh, risk of permanent damage. Uh, we have not had any uh, real reports of uh, 
damage uh, on any of our uh, units that our customers use in production. Uh, the only thing we have seen is we had one that uh, actually was used in a SLT application. So it was you know, under that condition for uh, you know, a long period of time, like 20, 25 minutes. And after it came out, it had a set and it caused problems later on. Uh, you know, going from a frown to a smiley face, they had problems in a manufacturing environment. So it does help us, you know, that, uh, you know, the, these large devices are somewhat uh, compliant, but there is a risk in there of causing a problem. And, uh, all devices now that we get, uh, typically they're ambient, they all have convex uh, curvature, which makes it uh, harder to uh, uh, control. Okay. okay. Uh, the other, uh, another uh, problem that we're running into is uh, geometric constraints is, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the rise of using more and more uh, multi-chip modules. So here's a typical one that we've seen. Uh, you know, they, these, these are not that difficult to uh, handle. Uh, we optimize our thermal control for the monolithic uh, GPU as shown on here. So it'll be for the high power dissipation. We, uh, we optimize the, uh, uh, the, the thermal testing for that device. And all the other ones usually only have a uh, requirement that they stay within a controlled range. So we may on a high power die have a requirement that you have to stay with the plus minus three degree centigrade, but the other ones just uh, cannot burn up. So th these are not that difficult to handle. There's a, you know, a little bit of a extra mechanical design to uh, do these, but they're not that difficult. Now, when you get something like this, where you have uh, multiple devices that are, uh, you, know, you know, that are high power, they're individual die, and every one of them needs to be controlled to a tight temperature. Uh, so unless they are manufactured with, uh, you know, a, a very cold planar surfaces, uh, we have difficulty handling this. Um, luckily, the ones we've had to do so far have been fairly uh, uh, coplanar. Uh, and within the power ranges that we have to work with, we've been able to handle them. But we see more of these coming along and uh, having more and more issues. Here's another one that uh, you know, I wanted to show, even if it's a lidded device, uh, it can cause us problems because we have, uh, well, you know, our thermal units are, uh, you know, a certain sizes. Uh, and then if we need to put our thermal unit on a device, you look at the lid being uh, as a very nice spreader. Uh, it is, but if you look at the, you know, this particular uh, example, if you had an equal power density on every single die and you had a lid on there and you put a, uh, our thermal unit on there, you can see that we uh, still get a big radiant. Uh, and you know, we, we can make larger thermal units. Uh, you know, the issue is, is there aren't many applications that require thermal units that are that big. Uh, the other issue is, is anytime you make two, thing, two surfaces that are very big, now you need to, uh, uh, now, now you need to make sure that all the surfaces are flat. We run into the same problem that we talked about before. If we don't have flat surfaces, we start getting uh, issues. Okay. So some of these things that uh, you know, well, we talk about with the geometric constraints, it would require a very good thermal interface material. Now we, we do use TIMS, uh, but I can tell you most, ap most applications, uh, the test engineers or you know, the people that, will do anything not to use a TIMS. The uh, higher performance, uh, uh, you know, the graphics processors, the high performance uh, um, you know, microprocessors, all those customers typically have used TIM and they're not that resistant. <clears throat> you have a whole class of other customers that do not want to use TIM because of the hassle of using it. <clears throat> but the requirements that we need is low thermal resistance, highly compliant, reusable to many cycles. Uh, we need very repeatable performance, no residue or easily clean and easily refurbished if we, if we need to. So I, I seen some of the slides that uh, you know, Dave had that he had 1000 uh, uh, cycles and that was a success. Uh, for us, uh, some of our uh, handlers do you know, tens of thousands of units per hour. Uh, a thousand cycles would not last very long. Uh, so uh, 
we do have Tim's that we use. Uh, okay. You know, there was some talk, I think uh, this was mentioned, the, the IBM uh, a long time ago used helium. Uh, that does help quite a bit, but uh, you know, it's a high consumption cost and there's a global shortage right now. And you probably would have, uh, you know, the test floor, everybody talking like Donald Duck if you have too much uh, helium out there. Uh, malleable metal, we have used malleable metal. Uh, you know, typically we, we have used indium. Uh, you know, it's got a good conductivity. It is subject to oxidation. Uh, if, you had a, you know, if you had gold, you know, that's a malleable metal, but uh, I don't think anybody would uh, seriously consider using that. Uh, but the oxidation, uh, indium itself, uh, it oxidizes, it, it creeps over time. And for us, that's a limit of time. Uh, and we also, if we need to use indium, um, and here I'm talking about pure indium. Uh, I know there are other, uh, you know, for us, the, uh, the other alloys uh, of indium do not have the nice malleability and compliancy. So we, you know, we, we are talking about the malleable uh, pure indium. Yeah, it melts at 150 degrees C. 154, I think, is the actual melting temperature. And we have to do quite a bit of testing at uh, temperatures above that. We have used liquid metal alloy. Uh, it uh, excellent conductivity and compliance. And uh, it actually works real well in some of the applications we had where we've had long test times. But every time you disengage and engage, you, uh, you agitate the liquid metal and you, uh, you, you know, cause more oxidation. Uh, you need a containment mechanism. There usually is a limited temperature range. There isn't one that can be used at hot and cold. And some of the alloys that uh, are recommended uh, may attack other metals. You know, for instance, gallium. A gallium will attack aluminum. And uh, we, uh, we do have aluminum in our system, so we have to be very careful, careful to use those. We use liquids. Uh, so, you know, water, we do use water on... Uh, uh, you know, as a Tim in between our uh, thermal unit and a device itself. Uh, this again, uh, you know, it, it gives us a great conductivity. You know, your water is a you know, uh, great material. There is a limited temperature range. You know, if you want to test above 100 degrees C or below uh, zero degrees C, uh, you, uh, uh, you know, you have a problem using water. You can put additives in there. Uh, there are some additives that are better for hot. There are additives that for cold, but if you start putting additives in there, you may have to have uh, some removal process or cleaning problems. Uh, the water, you know, again may uh, may evaporate, but the other additives may not. Uh, we have elastomeric; uh, we've used those. Uh, the bulk con uh, connectivity can be good. There are some that are very good. Uh, they are very compliant, you know, because they are elastomers. Uh, their compressor may be limited. Uh, quite often, we need to, uh, uh, you know, plunge the uh, device into a socket. And if it's got uh, 4,000 pins in it, uh, you can imagine how high the pressure is there. And some of these elastomeric, uh, you know, TIMS cannot handle that. They are subject to creep. Uh, we do see creep over time. And uh, elastomeric uh, typically need another material to make it easily removable from the device under test. So that causes an additional uh, resistance. We have looked at uh, carbon, uh, graphite and carbon-based. Uh, they have uh, excellent connectivity, but they may be uh, uh, directional. They're not really compliant. If you looked at some of those curvatures that we showed, uh, you know, they, they really do not comply that well. They're very robust. We, uh, you know, we're impressed about how robust they are. But again, the other thing that uh, I think Dave mentioned, the interfacial resistance, they're only as good as the resistance on the both sides of that uh, tin. So the, resist the resistance to the dot and resistance to the th thermal unit has to be managed well. Okay. But you know, uh, you know, the one thing I can say that uh, practical good performing tin is a critical need. You know, high power applications, you know, the major resistance is between the dot and the thermal unit. Uh, the high power applications that we have to handle, you know, with the graphics or the uh, you know, the complex microprocessors. Uh, the package designers have already done a very good job in designing and uh, making sure that the package itself has a low thermal resistance uh, to the surface. Uh, so the, uh, the really, during our test, the, the main problem is the tin between our thermal unit and the device itself. Okay, so currently when we have a, a tin, it's only used in limited uh, applications. We may have one that works with an SLT or a burn-in application. 
but it can't be used for the uh, high uh, functional tests, uh, high psychofactional tests. And the market for this type of tin is small, so there's a limited supplier competition. If you go and look at the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, manufacturer of tins right now, and you tell them that you want to buy a hundred uh, of these units per year, they're not very happy to uh, tool up and try to uh, come up with something for you. And the requirements are fairly tough too. Okay. Uh, the other issue with uh, uh, using a TIM, since we have never found a TIM that is, uh, you know, a mechanical TIM, I should say, that uh, it, it can handle the uh, uh, the full life cycle that we need, we need to be able to, uh, you know, tell when the TIM is degrading so we know whether to replace it or not. And you know, the you know the the proven method, just like you you saw the TIM testers uh, in the, one of the previous applications, you know, just to do a steady state test, look at the uh, uh, look at the uh, uh, temperature drop across there. Uh, that's not trivial uh, in a manufacturing environment. Uh, we have to handle quite a few devices where there is no thermal sensor available on the device itself, uh, and putting a, a fixed power into the device. Uh, is not straightforward. So uh, to, to test mechanical TIM, if we came up with something, we thought we had the uh, correct properties in it, we would still have to come up with a way to try to evaluate uh, when it is time to change it. Okay. So temperature gradient, uh, you know, this is something that uh, I think has been touched on in, uh, in a few of the other presentations. But you know, basically, we do a you know, if you look at the diagram on the side, the simplified uh, uh, schematic there, we work really hard to make the uh, thermal resistors from DUT to the TU to be as small as possible. So you make that better and better, whether it's with a TIM or you know, we you know, uh, you know, very uh, you know, flat surfaces. Uh, it gets to the point where the in-plane resistance of the DUT is higher than that resistance in uh, from the thermal unit to the duct. So uh, you know the uh, uh, you know the problem is that you know you never get perfect uh, uh, you know uniform thermal resistance or thermal connectivity between a thermal unit and duct. So even if I had a duct that had uh, perfect uh, power density distribution over its uh, surface, I still would get thermal gradients. Because I cannot make that resistance from the dot to the TU uh, to be uniform uh, everywhere because either it could be because of the flatness of the dot uh, or, or other issues. So uh, these are, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is a real concern. Uh, it's also a concern that uh, quite often, uh, you know, in uh, uh, it, you know the putting a thermal sensor in a device under test is an afterthought by the chip designers. Uh, I just, I put this in here. I can share one uh, story that I had where uh, I was called and said that uh, the uh, temperature balls uh, on the device were melting during test. Uh, we were controlling to the temperature sensor. Uh, we took a record of the temperature sensors. Uh, the, the control to that temperature sensor was rock solid. Uh, but there is such a big gradient on that device that the solder balls melted. Okay. So here's an example that this is something that we did with test chip. If you look on the lower left, you can see the test chip and the little dots. I don't know if, uh, if my cursor is, uh, can you see my cursor? These are the temperature sensors. Uh, can anybody tell me if my cursor is? Uh, yeah, we can see it. Okay. So you can see there are, uh, uh, there are nine temperature sensors. There's one right here in the center, that's a, a temperature, uh, you know, sensor nine. And then there's one inside the, uh, the heaters. Okay, so all these uh, meandering are actually heaters. And then there are four also in the corner. So in this particular example, we were controlling it to one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, sensors that are inside of the uh, heater uh, field. And we were monitoring the temperature of multiple devices. So you can see that, uh, you know, when uh, with uh, sensor eight, which is up here, that is held at 120 degrees C and that is solid. 
But look what's happening with uh, you know, sensor nine, which is in the middle. You know, as all these other sensors are close to 120, this sensor goes all the way down to 90 degrees. So there is a 30 degree gradient between uh, this uh, sensor number nine and this sensor number eight. Okay, so you know the you know the uh, the first thing you would think of is yeah let's uh, let's control to the sensor uh, in the middle because that should give us a good temperature within the entire chip. If you control to this, you would have overshoot of temperatures uh, in the other areas by thirty degrees C. So you know this this these are problems that we do run into is where people put sensors into the devices. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so you know, this is a typical uh, uh, four-core processor. So this doesn't talk about anything about the non-uniformity of, uh, uh, you know, our uh, thermal interface or anything like that. But you can see with uh, any type of die, you have concentrations of, uh, you know, uh, hot spots and some places that are fairly cold. So this is all reference to having the uh, an isothermal surface on the back side. Uh, here and th these are the temperature rises above that isothermal surface and you know so in this area you'd probably you'd absolutely want to have uh, a sensor very close to the hot spots uh, where the cores are you wouldn't want to put the sensor off on the edge or in a corner somewhere this is exactly a problem that we ran into in the example that we had before and unfortunately that is uh, quite often what we see uh, on many devices uh, the chip was already designed and all of a sudden they say, well, now we got to put a couple of temperature sensors in there and their tendency is to put them off in the periphery. Okay, so uh, let's talk about uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, dot power versus time. This is another challenge. Uh, the, the absolute power is really not that much of an issue for us. If, if the dot power is uh, constant, uh, you know, it, you know, all we need to do is to make sure that uh, the thermal unit is the right temperature and it's not, not a problem. So the dot power changes slowly. It's very easy to change the uh, thermal unit temperature to follow what the power is. If we have very fast or large changes of the power dissipation, then it's more difficult. So we've taken, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the approach that we want to try to make our thermal units as responsive as possible. So if you take a look at some of the uh, thermal units that we have, they can change temperature at a rate of about 100 to 200 degrees C per second. So that, uh, uh, you know, that helps us try to do now that, uh, you know, that doesn't mean we can change the duct at uh, that rate, but our thermal unit by itself can change at that rate. So the uh, uh, yeah. right. so uh, these are two examples uh, that uh, you know one in the left was actually measured in the field the uh, the one on the right uh, was given to us by uh, uh, one user of our equipment so you know the uh, the absolute power okay here getting to about 600 rounds is not the issue what the issue is is these large uh, changes in power. We need to try to control that and make sure that we can uh, we can move our thermal unit fast enough. So you can see here, there's an initial rise going from zero to about 400 degrees. It goes down, goes back to 200, it goes up to 500, it just keeps moving around. This one, you can even look at it, uh, if you look at these uh, here from 200, well, let's see, let's look at the 200 to 600. Oops. So, so here we have a 400 watt change. So we have to try to control these and uh, you know, uh, basically keep them within uh, an acceptable range for the, uh, for the user. Okay. So this is a bigger issue than the absolute power itself. Okay. Uh, so what control modes do we use in the ATC? So uh, yeah, there was some talk about uh, uh, having uh, help from the tester. Uh, I would welcome that if we could ever get something that uh, the tester uh, can uh, work with us. We've had uh, very little uh, luck working with testers. Uh, if they measure a device temperature, they typically use a uh, commercial off the chip test that uh, measures two currents or three currents if they wanna get rid of the lead resistance. 
and those typically have uh, a lag in them. So uh, by the time the tester tests it, uh, the, you know, it takes at least 30 milliseconds. Those chips actually have anywhere from a 30 to 100 millisecond uh, you know, rate which they can change the temperature, where they can measure the temperature. And then by the time they send it to us digitally, there's a long lag in between the, the actual temperature change and when we get it. The other issue is if the temperature change is, uh, is rapid, then uh, using those three currents is not accurate because the temperature is changing while they're measuring the, the uh, temperature of the device. So that when you measure the first, second or third current, the temperature may not have been the same during the three times. So there are, uh, there are uh, custom circuitries that can be done using a dynamic current that can give you a real time temperature uh, you know, with rates of about one millisecond, but they're not off the shelf. Uh, so uh, what we do uh, with our customers, we try not to go through the tester. The other issue with the tester also is that uh, their, uh, their priority is doing the test and not giving us information. Uh, so if, uh, if we ask for a uh, temperature, uh, we ask for a circuit on a load board itself that will give us a uh, analog voltage that's proportional to temperature. And we read that temperature and we use that. That also uncouples the handler from the tester or from anything else. The, uh, uh, the, the uh, fight for the temperature sensor is also sometimes between the handler and the tester. The tester needs to know what it is and we need to know what it is. Uh, if it's turned into an analog temperature, then both the tester and the handler can read it. And our, you know, our temperature control in order to handle these uh, very fast changing temperatures, uh, you know, we are reacting within less than a millisecond to any changes that we see in the uh, temperature of the device. So the temperature control modes that we do use, uh, the very simplest one is just HTF, we call it, uh, it's called heater temperature feedback, where we control the temperature of the thermal unit itself. And for some customers, this is, this is plenty. They, uh, uh, the device is, uh, is designed in such a way to have a very flat surface. Uh, it may or may not have a TIM and the, the temperature rise above the thermal unit is acceptable. Okay, so if you have a very good TIM and a very flat surface, uh, even with uh, you know, moderately high powers, you can probably still get to a temperature range that you want to be. Now we, we have done uh, uh, changes in the uh, you know, temperature based on ant anticipated power profile. Uh, that's somewhat open loop. Uh, we haven't done that in a long time. We probably tried that about 15, 20 years ago, but uh, we went to the path of trying to make our thermal unit faster. And uh, quite often uh, it runs into a problem. Uh, some, in some cases you have well-known power profiles. In some cases, if you have branching, uh, that causes issues. So we really don't do too much uh, with anticipated power profile. We do know customers that uh, do, do that, but they do it kind of roundabout way with our system. It's not something that we directly uh, get involved with. Uh, one of the uh, control modes that I think you've heard a couple of times uh, if you were in yesterday's presentation is called power following. Uh, uh, power following is a measurement uh, of the device power to uh, you know, change the temperature of your thermal unit. Uh, it's, uh, it's fairly good. The only uh, real problems are uh, you, you typically want to use this when you have a high power. If your thermal resistance changes between your device and your thermal unit, uh, any of those changes, everything has tolerances with it, uh, you actually get an error uh, that's proportional to that change in that thermal resistance. The other problem is, is you're also, uh, if you can think if you have to make a change of 10 degrees with your thermal unit, uh, there is kind of an asymptotic, uh, you know, uh, asymptotic response to get to that temperature. So it's not the fastest performing uh, you know, uh, control mode. Now we do have something that we call dynamic power following, where we use, uh, you know, we look at the, uh, the change in power, not necessarily the power itself. And we'll react to that power to drive the uh, temperature to, uh, uh, to where it needs to be. 
Now this is not a control mode that's used by itself, but it's used with uh, dynamic, uh, with power following or what we call the direct temperature feedback. So the, we use a direct temperature feedback as probably the most accurate if you have the sensor in the correct location. So it's typically a, a, a diode. Uh, we see RTDs mostly on test chips. I don't think we see them very much on uh, actual devices. Uh, it's theoretically the most accurate and uh, very stable. <clears throat> now the uh, sensor output varies with manufacturing tolerances. Uh, so there are two ways to handle that. Uh, typically the slope is constant, but the offset is, is, uh, is the variable. Uh, you can do a in situ uh, 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 calibration where you actually soak the device before you test it to the correct temperature. And then you can do a, uh, a quick measurement of the uh, output from the temperature sensor. And then you've calibrated the, uh, uh, the, the temperature sensor. Uh, this, this works fairly well. Uh, it, uh, there are some, some cases where it does not work. There have been some uh, uh, high power devices that uh, you cannot get really a feedback uh, unless it's powered. And sometimes we have devices that uh, they power on and they immediately dissipate, you know, 30, 40 watts. Uh, you can't get them to, you know, negligible power. Now you can use the uh, saturation current cancellation technique. And as I mentioned before, they're off the shelf chips that use discrete currents. Uh, those typically have a lag in them. Uh, again, we, we want to respond uh, within a millisecond. Uh, and you know, if we don't get a, uh, uh, if we don't get a signal for, you know, let's say hundred milliseconds, uh, that's a huge lag that uh, at the, some of these high powers we really can't afford. Uh, so there are uh, other ways of using the uh, uh, you know, saturation current cancellation technique. They use dynamic current instead of individual currents, but they are uh, custom circuitry. It's not something you buy off the shelf. We already talked about this, that uh, the sensor is not uh, in an optimal location. So that would be a, a negative. That's why you would not want to use this type of uh, feedback, power feedback, power following probably would be a better feedback if the, uh, uh, if the sensor is not in the right place. Uh, okay, so let's talk about this. Uh, common fear from Tasper, that's usually not usable. Again, I've heard people talk about the suggestion to use it. I think we would welcome that. But uh, right now, usually uh, what we've seen is that uh, Okay, we'll give you the temperature of the uh, of the device, and they only give it during subtest. So the tester is along testing something, then it has a break, measures the temperature, and then it gives us the uh, the temperature at uh, red. One that it's not frequent enough to give us good, high performance response. Second is it's usually taken when it's not doing anything anymore, because during a subtest it's not testing; it's just testing the uh, you know the uh, the temperature sensor. Okay. And uh, you know the uh, there are strategies that uh, uh, you know some uh, customers use uh, where they have multiple sensors, uh, for instance, in multi chip modules. Uh, they will monitor the uh, uh, they will monitor the temperature of multiple sensors on the device. Uh, they may use an average. They may use a max. It's really the algorithm they want to use during your test, and then they send us one temperature back that we control to. So this is an example where we used uh, a uh, direct temperature feedback. So this is one of the power profiles I showed earlier where we went from uh, uh, you know, basically zero watts to 400 watts, back to 200, uh, up to 500, and then it uh, stays around 400 and then uh, comes up. So uh, this was using a temperature sensor that we directly monitor. Uh, and again, without having feedback that doesn't come with a huge lag, this would not be possible. We do have another control mode that we've used in production, uh, not often because it, uh, it does not work in all situations. Uh, but you know, it does, there are a couple of things that are required. You really have to have 
uh, you know, very low resistance between your duct and your thermal unit. Uh, we call it extrapolated temperature feedback because we have multiple sensors on our thermal unit. We monitor those sensors and we extrapolate well, what, uh, you know, based on everything we know, what is the duct temperature? So you're doing an extrapolation. Uh, there's some dynamic terms in there. And if you do have uh, uh, an excellent TIM, it does work. So here's an example where we're controlling using the extrapolated temperature feedback, we're pulsing it between zero and 150 watts. And you can see that uh, this particular, this was a test chip. Uh, you know, we're going uh, from about 107 degrees to about 113 degrees. So we're getting six uh, degree, five or six degree overshoots and undershoots when we do a step of 150 watts. Okay, so, you know, kind of in conclusion, uh, uh, oh, uh, this isn't a conclusion, sorry. Uh, we, uh, it is much more difficult for us to test at cold with any appreciable power than it is at hot. Uh, if you uh, tell us that you want to control at minus 40 degrees C and you're gonna put 25 watts in there, uh, that's much more difficult than uh, doing 80 uh, degrees C or 100 degrees C and you're gonna tell me to put 500 watts in there. The, uh, uh, you know, the cooling sources that we have, unless we use liquid nitrogen, uh, you know, the cooling sources typically start uh, phasing out at about minus 40. We have uh, chillers and uh, uh, they go down to minus 70. Uh, and to, uh, we can stretch that to minus 80, but the capacity is fairly low at that point. Uh, you know, the, uh, there's a big resistance to using liquid nitrogen. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the practical limit, uh, you know, for really good control is minus 40. Uh, minus 55 is a requirement right now that we use, but usually with the uh, low power. As I mentioned before, uh, the multi-stage compressors are expensive and big, and there's a, a problem with the oil return. Liquid nitrogen is costly. And then, uh, you know, condensation control becomes a problem. And so the, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, the other issue is that, uh, you know, you have secondary pass to ambience. So at hot, you know, those, uh, those help you. They actually cool the device for you. Uh, at cold, they're a burden. They, uh, you, you're bleeding uh, energy back toward the device. So uh, cold for us uh, is much harder to do. Unfortunately, we are seeing, uh, you know, uh, the, the device power increasing at cold. Uh, not as much as you see at hot. Uh, the, uh, we, don't, we don't have the issue with the leakage currents, but there are devices that are starting to switch quite a, uh, quite a bit and they are uh, dissipating some power at cold. Okay, so the, the dominant factors that we look at, uh, you know, we don't look at absolute power. That's really not uh, the best measure. Uh, it's the duct power dissipation density, uh, the magnitude of power dissipation changes during test. Uh, the test set point, hot is much easier and cold. Uh, uh, the duct package resistance, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, manufacturers that have been making high power devices for years, you know, the AMDs, the IBMs, the Intels, uh, they know how to design a package that can be uh, tested with, uh, you know, because they, they uh, you know, have already made the thermal resistance very low. Uh, you have, now quite a bit of, uh, you know, in the industry, uh, you know, that never had to worry about high power dissipation or testing it in ways that has higher power dissipation that I didn't have to do that before. We had a recent application where uh, a chip that goes into a cell phone was being tested and it was dissipating 25 watts. <clears throat> now, I, you know, that, uh, that sounds a little counterintuitive, but uh, it's not, the way it's going to be used is just the way it's being tested. Uh, so in the, in the actual uh, application in the cell phone, it's going to be a fraction of a watt. But when they test it on, you know, on a test floor, uh, they, they're you know, approaching 25 watts. Okay. And the uh, device geometry is always changing. With the change to row house, we actually see much more curvature. Uh, that's causing us a problem. Uh, the application requirements vary greatly. Uh, you know, one manufacturer, uh, you know, one, you know, one thing is important that's not important to another manufacturer. Uh, 
And sometimes the initial requirements for, uh, for the application are erroneous. Sometimes they tell us it's, you know, what they tell us is too stringent. Uh, they'll tell us, okay, I need to do 400 watts and I need to do, you know, uh, you know 400 watts of cold also. We usually know those aren't uh, correct, but, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, we have had situations where uh, I was at a, a site where they were doing testing and uh, they were very happy with the uh, thermal control. They told us it was 400 watts. Uh, looking at the dynamics that were tested, I can tell it wasn't anywhere above 80. Uh, the marketing people with me were, you know, hitting me, telling me to shut up and tell them that, you know, to, you know, to, to be happy that we have good control. But, you know, the bottom line is I told them that's not 400 watts. You know, it, you know that can't be any more than 80 watts. And they ended up making some uh, measurements and found out, yes, they were only doing uh, under 100 watts. And they went and tried to find some other devices that were dissipating more on their test floor and brought those for us to test. Uh, sometimes they, uh, you know, they, it's the other way, where they make plans they don't think they'll be uh, dissipating. All of a sudden, is okay, we got to get this going. You know, the, uh, you know, we, we, you know, we're ended up we're dissipating twice as much as we wanted to. So at that point in time, it's uh, fix it, but don't change anything. Okay, and I think I mentioned this before. So the new uh, temperature control cabinets, uh, candidates that uh, we did not have to work with before, but we do now like mode, uh, mobile and automotive applications, uh, they give us a big challenge right now because their devices are starting to dissipate power. And the test engineers that had worked, uh, you know, in those industries had not have to worry about those issues. And that's it. Thank you, Jerry. Um, we, we did run over and so we don't have much time for questions. Uh, one that just I wanted to feed on what you were just talking about. Um, we talked on a number of talks about the need to plan early for the thermal, for everything else going on here. If you were designing a, or if you were consulted on a 500 to 1000 watt part um, and asked what, how low of temperature can I test it at? What would you answer these days? What's realistic? If I wanted to talk about a 500 watt uh, device, uh, a 500 watt, I think, uh, you know, to, with the existing technology, uh, I probably would not be able to you know, sign up for anything, let's say, uh, under 50 degrees C. Okay. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of a, a, a soft, tar a gray area because it depends on the package and other things, but. Well, understood. So the package and the other things is what a lot of the other questions about, like what type of warpage do you anticipate? I mean, can you handle what type of warpage is bad? You had your, your early slide on that. Uh, well, what we've seen, uh, uh, typically we see uh, convex uh, and that is not as bad. Uh, concave is, is much worse, but we don't see that uh, quite often. We see uh, convex, so you'll see uh, basically the uh, just the, the tip of the curvature hitting there at TU. Uh, if it's the other way around, even if we put a TIM in there, you get into all the issues of you're going to be trapping air bubbles and everything else, and uh, you're actually uh, uh, you know, putting contact on a periphery of the device, uh, not in the center. Uh, but can't you flatten out the device with vacuum and other things, isn't, or is that a problem? Uh, the vacuum really can't, uh, uh, you know, uh, do that. You know, really, really, what flattens, uh, you know, devices that are uh, convex. Uh, you know, these the are pressure. devices that have, you know, they have thousands of, uh, you know, pins in there, and you're putting quite a bit of force in there. Vacuum couldn't do that. Got it. Hey, hey so, 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 Rob here. So, if I can make a comment on that. So, from my experience, right? So, uh, we usually test that pot, and when you test the device, it's going to flatten out to some extent. It, so that actually helps it. It's when you go cold that's the problem. Now you're, you know, that's worst case curvature, and that's when you really need a good tin. That is correct. It really gets uh, curved at cold. Yeah. cold, cold Obviously, cold, cold is a real issue all around. Yeah. Obviously, um, large packages have more of a problem with this. Can you handle uh, how large a package can you handle? Can you do multi site? Um, what, what, where, where are the limits of the capability these days? Uh, you know, the uh, multi-site uh, is, we do have uh, some to use that have multiple, multiple zones. Uh, that's not a very common thing. 
the uh, I think our largest TU that we have right now is only 39 millimeters, uh, but we do have uh, some in the roadmap that go up to uh, 50 some millimeters. Thank you. Um, there is multiple there votes. Okay. Multiple votes for another question. I'm sorry, did I cut you off, Jerry? No, that's okay. I just, yeah, that's fine. Multiple questions around the technology. You know, we're at seven nanometers today with significant thermal spikes and a path to two nanometers. And we're wondering if we're going to get into problems at test with thermal impedance, where silicon is really the limiter on what we can do, and only DFT will allow uh, repeatable test results. Any thoughts about the future in TIMS and thermal units? Well, the 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 thin that uh, you know for the for for our, our thermal unit itself, uh, you know uh, the limitation the limitation we have now are not going to be any different than the limitations then. Uh, you know, so if we can get a good tim that we can get directly to the silicon itself, I think we'll still be able to handle it. Uh, the you know the real issue is if you start putting uh, you know uh, very concentrated nodes, your power density is very high in that one area. So we can still get the the power out, but I can't tell you exactly what the uh, you know what that localized. Oh, is. Yeah. Yeah. So what else? Right. I, I, I think the uh, you know the, the problem gets worse and worse uh, as you do that. Uh, you know, so if you have hot spots, I mean, I did mention uh, the technology that we had looked at briefly with someone else, where we can actually uh, shoot a drop you know, in a localized area, and that could do a very good job, but uh, that may require doing uh, something exotic like that. Yeah, hey, Dave and Jerry, so, so my thoughts on that. So uh, I think anyway, once, as we're getting down to these uh, lower processes, is yeah, you probably have to have some kind of singulated dye solution where you're testing dye, one of the types of the package, and on a small enough shot that you can really control well. So yeah, that's my thought on it. Anyway, that would be the best way to test. Thank you for that, Rob. I think we have time for one last question. Um, and, and, and this is, I, I chose this question because this keeps coming up on thermal sensors. I've, I've probably seen three or four talks talking about location of sensors, customizing the access to the sensor. How do we as an industry grapple with that? And can we get to a consistent sensor location, consistent thermal interface that we can leverage from die to die in the future? Any thoughts? I don't think you can get to the point where you have a consistent uh, uh, location because the, the architecture of the die, every die is different. Uh, you're going to have different uh, uh, you know, architecture, if you're a graphics processor, you're going to be different if you're a microprocessor. Uh, so they don't necessarily, uh, uh, you know, distribute the power the same way. And, uh, you know, I really think in the, uh, you know, again, Rob could probably talk on this better, but uh, uh, it, it's probably going to be, get to the point where you need to have multiple sensors on the device itself. And you're going to have to monitor all of them and decide which one you're controlling to, or have some algorithm to uh, to control across all of them. And unfortunately, I think it will also get us to a spot where we um, uh, the, the tester is going to be right in the path. And uh, you know what you were saying, you, you hate to have the tester in the path, but you know I do think that we're going to have to work more closely together. Uh, yes, I think I think that would be great if we could. But again, the uh, what what my experiences in the past has been uh, any solution that's come up with uh, was too slow to do any realistic control. Too slow. I, I guess you you said the magic words for one more question. How slow is slow today, and how slow is too slow? Okay, well, again, that that's a gray area. It depends what it is. But the uh, for instance, in the uh, power response that I showed you. If I use the, you know, using the uh, standard way of measuring uh, the a diode where you would take the three currents, uh, you know, th that could be anywhere from 30 to 100 mi uh, uh, milliseconds. That is way too slow. Uh, you know, in, in, that, in that time, we could have moved our TU uh, temperature by at least 10 degrees. So that would be way too slow. Uh, you know, we, we really want to be able to measure the temperature real time as possible. 
But that's, yeah. that's, that's why we, uh, you know, we say, you know, do whatever you need to do and give us an analog signal that's real time. So, you know, we, we do have a, one customer that uh, measures multiple sensors. They have a high speed FPGA and then they control a, uh, a D to A to give us the voltage that we look at. It's uh, it's uh, still real time. Actually, I was looking for the response time of the ATC, and it sounds like you know you're talking in the 50 millisecond range. Is that no? Our, our ATC response time is less than a millisecond. Okay. I think with that, I'm going to uh, call this session to an end and uh, pass the baton back to, to Rob. Uh, first off, thank you, Jerry. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Adventist, Omcore, Indium, Form Factor, and Nidic SDTCL. Uh, Adventist, a global leader in ATE uh, with advanced nanotechnology products supporting leading edge devices with a global workforce in 50 countries and eco-friendly policies. Uh, Omcore, um, providing OSAT uh, advanced engineering and package leadership in their technology and quality of course in execution automation and uh, starting with quality and a service design and test through drop ship with a global manufacturing footprint, but local sales and support. And Indium, the premier assembly materials uh, designer and manufacturer of thermal interface materials. We did talk a lot about TIMS today, but they have a wide range of them. Uh, solder paste, fluxes, preforms, and uh, metals and compounds. So I'd like to thank all the sponsors for making this event possible. And please uh, thank them when you talk to them so that they know that they are appreciated. I wish everyone a good day and look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. So thank you.